All right, thank you all. Uh, I hope you can all hear me clearly. Yes, all right. Uh, so I'm Gus Klinkenberg. I'm an engineer at ING, uh, where we mostly use Java and Kotlin. So there won't be any Python in this presentation, or rather there won't be any code at all in this presentation. So sorry to disappoint you, but it's what it is. It's about productivity, which I think is core to the job that we do, and also core about uh, how we get enjoyment, because I believe that as we are productive, we are enjoying our work. Um, and recently there's been a lot of uh, research and discussion uh, about productivity and about developer experience, which is a large factor in productivity, or at least I believe so. So in this presentation I will go uh, over what is productivity and I will also uh, give a short introduction on developer experience, which I think is an uh, important part of it. Um, so yeah, let's start with the first question. What is productivity? Um, Productivity, to me at least, is a very intangible thing. It's not like, oh yeah, it's seven, right? Um, so I want to talk a bit about uh, a side job that my mom had when she was uh, younger, when she was a student. Um, she did different jobs in uh, bars and uh, restaurants, but she also had one in an ice cream factory, where she used to pack eight ice creams into a box and then had to seal the box. It was not very challenging work, um, as you might imagine, um, but it earned good enough for the time, uh, so she did. Um, and when you think about productivity for such a job, you might think, oh, it's easy. It's about how many boxes an hour can you fill, right? So if you fill 10 boxes an hour, well, your productivity is probably not high enough for the work you're doing. Um, so let's just put that one aside for a minute. Uh, she filled the boxes and those boxes go out to retailers, they go out to stores, to uh, bars. Turns out some of them uh, are defective. Either the box is not sealed properly or uh, the ice cream is damaged. Um, and then you're already like, okay, so how can we try and measure this? If this is part of your productivity, right? It's part of the result you're creating, the product you're creating. So now you're thinking, okay, ice cream is defective. Is it because of handling or because the machine produced it wrong? Uh, and you already see that uh, the productivity measurement, if you go to measure this, is already outside of just a single employee. Uh, because the machine may be the problem. And this is a large part of why measuring productivity is hard. So then why do we want to measure it, right? Why do we want to measure productivity? Um, well, it, it's plain simple to me, but I think uh, we want to measure it to compare opportunities. If we can buy one of, or two, of two machines, we want to know what the increase in productivity is, how much it costs, so we can make a very nice comparison and make the right decision based on data. Uh, we can use it to uh, find weaknesses in our process. Where can we improve? Um, and in essence, productivity is about the effort needed to make a product or to create your product. And because this is so essential to a lot of companies, uh, we see that uh, a lot of people and a lot of companies want to create these frameworks to measure productivity, not only for things like stuffing ice into a box, but also for instance in telecom, right? Uh, call center employees are uh, measured in a lot of things, like how, uh, how quickly can they respond and uh, help a customer or how often they go to the toilet. Uh, so we see this intention also moving towards software engineering, right? The work we do. Um, but it's not that easy to measure, or at least we think it's not that easy to measure. Because software engineering is not uh, a, a very hard science in the sense that a lot of different people have different opinions on what is being productive and what is actually good code, right? So you can't easily, at least from the top of your head, say, oh, this is a measurement that we should take. So there... Uh, we see different uh, groups creating frameworks and, and uh, um, reference material on what is productivity. There's a space framework, which I will not mention uh, anymore in this talk, but they created a very interesting uh, layer. And from there on out, the DevOps Research and Assessment Group created their own set of metrics that they put out in the world based on uh, surveys they put out to uh, technology managers. What are they using to measure productivity? And they also make an assessment of those metrics. Um, and because uh, companies, big companies, want to use this as well, you also see uh, things like the OHI, the Organization Health Index, survey sent out to different companies where 
people put in what they think of uh, how their organization is working so that the company behind it can try and compare what co good companies are doing and find a silver bullet. And you also see companies like McKinsey that do strategic consulting, create their own frameworks, um, where they try to create uh, a measurement model that they can sell to companies as well. And this is actually what sparked a lot of the recent debate. Uh, McKinsey created a model, uh, which is shown here, uh, based on the inner loop and the outer loop. Um, the inner loop is what I think we as developers think is our work, right? It's about coding, building, testing, making sure that we are delivering a product. But uh, there's also what they say an outer loop. Things like deploying, doing security, risk, compliance, having meetings to make sure that uh, all components within the company are working towards the same goal. Um, and to make sure that we as a company deliver what we need to deliver. And they created various metrics for these, uh, like a de developer velocity index benchmark, where they put out a company-wide survey to compare processes and to compare the feeling of being productive. Uh, and they also want to do some backlog analysis to try and determine which uh, employees are being the most productive according to the backlog. And there was a lot of discussion online about this, uh, and I think the best response was written by two engineers, uh, being Ken Beck and George uh, uh, Olas. Uh, they have a 55 years combined of software engineering experience and also 15 plus years in uh, managing teams and uh, measuring productivity. And they created this very interesting model, which is shown here, um, which is easy to explain. We put in a certain amount of effort that leads to a certain amount of outcome uh, output, which produces a certain outcome uh, and that generates a certain impact, right? Um, and this is a bit fake, so I want to make it a bit more concrete by uh, filling it in for sales. Because sales is a relatively measured uh, profession, or at least I think it is, right? And they think as well because they filled it in for me. Um, so in terms of effort, you can uh, see uh, the amount of leads that, they're, uh, that sales is gaining, right? This is something that they've put effort in. It's about uh, meetings, it's about uh, setting up quotes. If you go to output, uh, you see the amount of emails sent, the amount of quotes sent, the amount of uh, contracts that are drafted. That is output that generate as part of their work. And this leads to a certain outcome. Uh, deals being closed, right? Uh, amount of money being generated. Uh, and this is a certain impact, and that's percentage of target, or uh, retention, upsell, churn. This is all things that are relatively measurable for sales. Now let's try and fill this in for software engineering. And this is what McKinsey uh, created, right? This is the metrics that McKinsey proposed in their model. And you can see that these are only in the effort, uh, most of them are in the effort uh, part, some in the output and impact, but none in the outcome. Um, and this is interesting, because as you can see back at this one, we have metrics all over the place, and here there's less metrics, and the ones we do have are not in all boxes. Um, and there's an interesting thing about this as well. Uh, the uh, DevOps uh, Research and Assessment Group, they have uh, metrics for effort and output as well, but almost all of them have warnings warnings that these metrics might not be the best, best metrics to use in uh, assessing productivity. Um, a very infamous uh, metric in terms of output is lines of code, right? Um, I don't think that lines of code is a good way to measure productivity. An engineer might remove 2,000 lines of code in a refactoring uh, uh, sprint. Uh, those sprints, in my opinion, uh, most of the time are quite effective, are quite productive, are good for the maintainability of the product. Uh, but according to lines of um, uh, code as a metric, they're in the negative, they're not doing productive work. Um, so for a lot of these uh, metrics that McKinsey proposes, uh, it's probably not the best metric to use. Furthermore, they're uh, often survey-based, uh, which also has an inherent bias. So I mentioned that a lot of these metrics uh, have warnings by the DevOps Research and Assessment Group. So let's have a look at what they propose. Um, they think about deployment frequency, uh, lead time for change, the mean time to recover, and the change failure rate as things that are indicative of productivity. 
because if you deploy in a proper way, they think, uh, you're being productive because you're not spending a lot of time on trying to resolve issues that you've seen before. Um, which is interesting. Uh, there's also a lot to say about it, but uh, there's two things I want to mention about it. And they, uh, Kent and Oros, uh, showed it quite nicely in this graph. Uh, here you see the different boxes once again, but in a different way. Uh, on the x-axis you see how easy it is to measure, and on the y-axis you see the alignment with the group. The alignment with the group being uh, aligning with company uh, goals, right? So what you're doing, what the effort you're putting in, it's all individual, right? Uh, I mean, you can collaborate with other people to send out an email, but you're sending out an email. Uh, meanwhile, the impact is mostly about uh, money being generated or uh, uh, reducing the amount of hours needed to do certain things, right? Um, so we can see that on the left side it's easier to measure um, and on the right side it's harder to measure. On the y-axis we see alignment with the group. Um, the impact is what's most important to them, right? About reducing the amount of hours or increasing the profit. Uh, but I'm an engineer at ING, I'm just a very small cog in the, the whole machine of ING. Uh, what I do as an individual is probably not that interesting with relation uh, with respect to the impact that we have as a department uh, within ING. However, the effort I put in is very personal. It's very much me, right? Um, and this difference can also lead to uh, uh, some problems. Uh, one of the things that uh, I saw mentioned as well was um, for sales, uh, they might keep a lead in the back pocket. Just keep it for a moment where they don't hit the targets. And that's the moment they pull out the lead and try to catch up with the targets that are, they're trying to achieve. For them, this is a good thing. But for the company, it's not a good thing because that customer might have already been up for, uh, um, for a new contract or they might want to extend that contract or expand it because they like the company so much. But because the engineer, uh, because the salesperson is the person that's generating the lead uh, and for them the goal is to make the targets, they might put it in the back pockets. So there's a lot of different discussions about what are good metrics, what are, uh, uh, what can we measure. And I don't think we're there yet in terms of uh, what we can measure. There's no one single silver bullet to, uh, to actually measure productivity. But I do think that we can take a lot of this as inspiration to make ourselves more productive. Um, Especially because organization-wide, you don't have a lot of influence, but within your team or within your department, you're able to do a lot of things that increase productivity. Um, so this is where we get into developer experience. Um, and developer experience is about you as a developer, what is your experience while developing? So how easy it is for you to develop, how easy it is for you to affect change, basically. Uh, so it's not about the years of experience that you have as a developer. And most of this is based on research done by the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Columbia uh, Canada, uh, by Microsoft and by DX, which is a developer productivity platform. And they created a very interesting model, or at least I believe so, of uh, pillars in developer experience. And those pillars are cognitive load, feedback loops, and flow state. Um, and these three, uh, I will go over uh, one by one and give some example in uh, how we try to improve those uh, uh, pillars, try to make it better, work better for us. So the first one is cognitive load. Um, I'm wondering if I might, I might ask the audience, how many of you have heard of the magic number seven? I see some hands raised. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, it's a paper from the 50s about how many things you can remember. So the idea is that you can remember seven numbers, seven words, seven sentences, uh, plus or minus two. So it might be more or less depending on your environment, who you are, uh, uh, your, your state, uh, how complex the data is you need to remember. And I think this is important to keep in mind as well when you're coding and when you're developing, especially when you're developing something that others will use. Um, because the more stuff they need to keep in mind, the harder it will be, and uh, the more they will have to do context switching. 
where they have to look up things uh, about whatever you're writing for them. Um, and I think this is a bad thing because um, generally people suck at multitasking. Uh, I can't answer my telephone right now and uh, produce a WhatsApp message to a friend of mine while I'm giving this presentation and continue doing this presentation in the same way. People can't multitask, but some people are good at contact switching. Some are not though, and we should keep that in mind while uh, producing uh, whatever we're producing for other people. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, make sure the documentation is there. Uh, there's often code documentation about uh, what functions are, uh, expect in terms of types or uh, in terms of data. Um, but there's also documentation as a general, like how is the flow through your library or through your API, uh, what order is the expected uh, calls, stuff like that. It's about things like code organization, right? If you're working in a big company, uh, often different developers will have a look at your code base, maybe without you even knowing. Um, and if the code is organized for you in the best way, um, it might be the best for you, but if all the people look at it, they are thrown through, uh, they're thrown through a hole, right? They can't find things and they have to go looking through the whole code base rather than almost being immediately able to find it. There's also things like uh, reducing toil, the, the amount of um, manual labor involved. Some APIs require an API key. Uh, if you're doing stuff like that, make sure the API key is immediately available, but maybe with a low usage rate, because then developers can progress and continue working on whatever they're using your products for. And the thing that we uh, did internally with this is that when I joined ING about a year ago, they were finishing up a product, a product that we use for reliability. So if any, um, any surface fails or any point in the surface fails, uh, it sends out a, they can send out a failure to our product, the retry tool, uh, which produces the whole, which can sort the whole context of the request. And then when they want it, they can send it back to their own process and can reprocess it. So when I joined the team, they asked me to create uh, an example uh, project where this tool is, in, uh, is used, not only as a way to verify uh, that it's working, but also as a way to find out if they produce the right documentation, organize it in the uh, right way, if the API itself made sense. Um, so that's what I did. We found some bottlenecks. Uh, we have released it about uh, three months ago. And since then, we haven't had any support requests, but we know that various teams are using it. So they were able to implement it without any help from our, uh, uh, without taking any of our time, just using documentation that's already there, which I think is a good thing. Um, the next pillar is feedback loops. Um, I don't know if you've been there, but I've once been in a project where I was working six months on uh, a product without ever getting, getting feedback from a user or an owner about what I was doing, if it was right or not. And it's not a good thing. Um, you get worried about, are you actually producing what people want to use? Um, and there's just this fear seeping in that you're not being productive because you're not releasing. And this is something that used to be the case all the time, right? Uh, back in the days, games were released and there were no patches because that was before the internet. Then we got the internet and some patches were introduced, but only for the big things and not that often. Uh, then we got monthly patches and now we often see, especially with uh, APIs, we see that they are released as they're done, right? We don't have to wait for a certain point of time. We just release it when it's done. And this is also about the feedback loop getting shorter and shorter. Um, so what we did, what we have internally is a pipeline that does a lot of our deployments. Um, some pipelines can take five minutes, some are 20, some are, and some are an hour. Um, our build pipeline within our team is about 20 minutes. And what it does is it pulls the code, uh, runs the unit test, it builds it, uh, put it in Docker container, and then scans the whole package of Docker container and the, uh, the application for vulnerabilities. And then you find out that you have a vulnerability in some dependency of a dependency. Um, and you have to update it, which is not even a minute's work. And you have to wait 20 minutes again to get a result on, is your application vulnerable? Um, which is not a good thing, because then you're waiting 20 minutes for uh, an automated process, right? 
So that's why we introduced local vulnerability checks, that we are able to do the scanning on our local machine, so that we're able to immediately get the feedback, oh, this package is a vulnerability, and you should try to resolve that. Um, yeah. Uh, and then on to the last one, being flow state. Um, and I'm also going to reference some, um, some work from uh, Cal Newport here. He's an avid writer, a computer scientist. Uh, he, has a lot of, uh, he has a lot of interesting books, uh, but the one I used for this one is called Deep Work. Which is about uh, how we should enable, uh, which is about how we should enable ourselves to do the complex work that we do. Um, and you know what doesn't work with complex work? Distractions, right? Um, we generally enjoy getting into a certain flow, uh, right? I, I mean, I hope I don't. Uh, uh, I think I hope everybody uh, sort of recognizes this: that you go sit behind your computer after lunch. And then you sort of get into a flow, a sort of trance, and suddenly it's seven o'clock, right? Your workday is done. You've produced a lot of code, uh, and you feel happy about it. You might be exhausted, but you feel happy about it. This is a certain flow, uh, a so, sort of trance. Uh, it's very good to have, but it can take up to twenty minutes to get into. So uh, if you're distracted by your phone or by Teams or an email. Um, you can spend up to 20 minutes to get back into the flow, to get back into that mental state where you're able to solve um, the, the problems that you have to solve. So we need to create an environment where we can do this work. Like I mentioned, the phone, put it away, put it in another room, put it on our, uh, underneath uh, your keyboard so you can't look at it. Um, this is something I did as well, but you should also look in, into it in, uh, within your team. Because I, we work in a very agile way, and we have stand-ups and refinements. Um, and these refinements used to be at two in the in the afternoon, and we had lunch from about one uh, from about twelve to one. So there was an hour between end of lunch and the start of refinements. And what I noticed for myself, and also with other developers, is that uh, a lot of the those people don't do coding in that hour because you can take up to twenty minutes to get into that flow. And you already know that within an hour you need to get into a meeting, so they do administrative stuff. And uh, it's not that that work doesn't need to be done, but it's nice to have the opportunity to get into that flow. So we moved our refinement from two to one, which did give business a bit of a, a pickle because they had to rearrange other meetings as well. Uh, but we did it, and a lot of uh, engineers also quite enjoyed this. And it's something you can also take a look at with your stand-up, right? I prefer to sleep in a bit. Another engineer in my team prefers to start early. And the same situation I just mentioned with refinement, he also has with the stand-up. Because he starts working at half past seven. And we have uh, our stand-up at quarter till nine. So that's also an hour uh, every day where he tries to do the work, but it might not be the best moment. Um, so with that, I want to conclude. Um, I don't think we're there yet in terms of metrics, right? I've shown that there's a lot of discussion going on about this, a lot of interesting ideas, and I think we do have to take these ideas as inspiration. But in the end, I do want to quote uh, Goodhart's Law. Uh, when a measurement becomes target, it ceases to be a good measure. Take the inspiration. Um, try to enable yourself uh, using these metrics and using uh, these uh, pillars of developer experience that I mentioned. Um, try to work on your documentation, on your code, to have a lower cognitive load so all the developers are um, able to work with it quite easily. And try to keep the feedback loop short. In the terms of uh, feedback loops, thank you for your attention, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.